Hi, I'm Faith from Voice Mag, and today I'm joined by Ellis Palmer, and we're going to be talking about his industry and disability as well. So, Ellis, thank you for joining me. If you would like to introduce yourself. Good morning, Faith. Hello, I'm Ellis Palmer. I'm a journalist at BBC World Service and BBC News. And I live with cerebral palsy, meaning I've got bad hand-eye coordination and I use a wheelchair or hand cycle as my main way of kind of getting around. Great. So I guess first question then, like what does your kind of day-to-day -day job entail? My day-to-day -day job is international news. My day-to-day -day job is getting people around the world on the biggest breaking global stories to come on the radio and tell us what's going on. It can be providing colour, it can be analysis, it can be holding people to account. But my day-to-day -day job is getting people from Africa, from Asia, from you know North America, from Europe, to come on and tell us about what's going on in the world to an audience of around 15 million people. And that that's scary on the one hand, but on the other, on the other, it's incredibly, incredibly, it's incredibly rewarding job getting to sit here and talk to people in Ecuador or in Papua New Guinea or French Polynesia and getting to hear their stories and getting to a lot of my job is, is is writing down what they say for our presenter and then editing the tape when it goes out on air. So a lot of my job is about thinking about the people that are listening in, you and I, and thinking about how they're going to hear the story and what they're going to want to hear. Being disabled, having gone to a comp in the north of England and being from the north of England means that I have maybe a slightly different approach to the news and to where the way people maybe address the news to your kind of average in London or in the bubble consumer. And that, that can be incredibly, incredibly valuable in terms of how I approach stories, how I address stories. Always thinking, you know, how is this going to be reached by, you know, your grandma or your granddad who's got the wrong radio on the dial or somebody who's just listening in in their car on the way to work in Lagos? How are they going to address the story and making sure that there's no assume knowledge, making sure that we address stories in an as open a way as we can so that everybody can understand them. Yeah, I mean, that's a really great answer. And I mean, I should probably kind of caveat it. We've, we've known each other for a little bit, so I, I already know a little bit about you. Uh, but what, I mean, that sounds great and it's kind of really interesting and I'm really interested in it because obviously I didn't start in journalism that long ago, uh, but what made you want to get into the industry? If I'm being honest with you, journalism was actually my kind of first choice of career path. My first choice of career path was politics and public policy, and that's what I always wanted to do during my undergraduate. Then towards the end of my undergraduate degree at Birmingham, and then I went to Barcelona for a year. Absolutely loved it. Would highly, highly recommend studying abroad if, if you can get the opportunity to do that, or living abroad even, because it opens you up to, you know, different cultural approaches and different ways of doing things. So when I was in Barcelona, I was inspired by so many great academics and people like that, that I decided I'd like to go to a master's and I'd like to go pick to a PhD. My downside was I probably picked the wrong master's degree. I picked uh, nationalism and current democracies at the Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona, uh, which is great, but very, very theoretical and very kind of droll. Probably what I should have done was what I'd love to have done was a master's in sociology and get to, you know, address the things that go on in society. So whilst I finished off my master's in Barcelona, somebody got in touch with me about a journalism scheme that the BBC were running called Extend, and they're like, oh, you should, you should try out for this. And I'd then I'd worked at Sky for a little bit as I was finishing off my degree, uh, working on sport and kind of all manner of sports, from football to rugby union to cricket to uh, the GAA to whatever it may be and getting to really get my teeth into things on the production side of things but I've never really what I'd always wanted to do with news what I'd always wanted to do with news and when the scheme came up I thought oh, I could better go but I never thought the BBC would want somebody like me so I never thought I never thought BBC would you know, I didn't have a fancy master's degree in journalism from yeah. a certain university in London or a certain un university in Wales. I didn't have any of that. So I didn't think BBC would necessarily want me. So 
I kind of was looking around at other jobs and applied for other jobs and everything like that. And then somehow got an interview for a job at BBC. And um that was that was that. And um kind of went in and I'd done, you know, most of my background prior to that being kind of social media marketing, working for coffee shops and online publications and all that kind of thing, managing their social media and doing all that. And that's kind of really what I enjoyed. But didn't earn a lot of money doing it. It was peanuts. So I was then like, oh, you know, I need to get a quote unquote proper job. So uh while well, my studies. So I would, you know, apply to BBC and somehow they they somehow they, they took me on, took a chance on me on my war talent and the rest of the saved history. I mean, in terms of developing the career, it's gone from they put me on uh, World Online as a writer. I'm a one fingered, one handed typist. Okay. I am not a fast breaking news writer by like any stretch of imaginations so I was kind of like this is interesting I love the topic but I'm like really slow at doing it and I don't think I'm doing it justice so I was then like you know what other things do I want to go do what other skills do I want to go develop and not having a master's degree not having any of that kind of background or skills other than kind of raw talent and and uh, geekiness about politics and what the way we are as a society and international news i decided to go off to digital video for a year where i filmed and edited and you know thought did things for like social media and the website and telly and all that and that was great that was wonderful really enjoyed it but it was about building layer upon layer my, my my passion what i love what i do every day is, is listen to the radio from the minute i get up to the minute i, I go to bed you know, it's, it's five lives usually bearing with it sport or something like that. So for, uh, the, the immediacy and the intimacy of radio is, is something I really, really love. Um, just being able to pick up the phone and talk to somebody and get it on air straight off and being able to get people's stories and get tell people's stories in a simple yet comprehensible fashion. I think it's kind of really important, really important. So that that was um that was what I did. And I went to the World Service, did a bit of five live, and then now back at the World Service. And you know, it's about the big thing I'd say, look, it's about building a layer upon a layer upon a layer. Nobody gets it right first time. You know, as a disabled person in the media and as a disabled creative for one of better terminology what you end up with is this kind of imposter syndrome constantly. Oh, oh, they're better than me. Oh, they can type faster than me. Oh, they can edit better than me, whatever. But it's about building layer upon layer upon layer and having as many skills and as many creative elements to your career as, as possible, you know, so that you can have the best career possible that you can, you know. You might start out writing, you might love that, but you might realise, you know, you're a one-handed typist and you might prefer radio and or you might prefer digital. So go and do those things. And, you know, the sky's the limit, really. You know, I think everybody kind of thinks, particularly as a disabled person, there is a kind of soft bigotry of low expectations, fortunately. Not something I really had that much at BBC, but there is a soft bigotry of low expectations around or you know, the disabled person can, I call it the basket weaving approach, not anything wrong with basket weaving, but uh, it's kind of all, we'll have the disabled person doing a bit of basket weaving kind of thing, rather than thinking, you know, what are the skills that this disabled person had? And actually, when it comes to employing disabled people, when it comes to having disabled people in society, you'll see that too few businesses and too few communities have enough disabled people out there every day because infrastructure isn't accessible. Your office might be on a higher floor with no lift or just infrastructure in terms of getting around isn't accessible, yeah. getting to the shops or, you know, being able to get to where you want to go to. And that's why things like remote working uh, in particular and for sure moving jobs out of London, but remote working especially, opens up career opportunities to so many disabled people that maybe previously didn't exist or they didn't think they could do because you know I, I can produce radio I can broadcast for the local radio just as well from home in my pajamas at five o'clock in the morning as I can being in an office somewhere in a fancy fancy city 
you know, yeah, yeah, it's the same absolutely. skills. You're looking at the same, you're looking at the same computer screen, you know. But actually, it's a lot easier for me to be able to do that with my cerebral palsy because you know the infrastructure is not accessible. I can't drive because of how expensive, you know, learning to drive would be. Yeah. So the best option for me to do with this kind of thing is to, you know, work from home and work remotely. And it does open up so many more opportunities to people maybe otherwise wouldn't exist. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, it's exactly the same for me. Like this is at Voice, this is kind of the first job I've had where it's been like completely work from home. And I've really kind of been able to explore what I wanted to do as a career. But I guess kind of what I would ask you is for people, because I used to be like it when I was slightly younger, but for people that are too scared to ask about reasonable adjustments at work, what kind of advice would you give them for asking for that as a disabled person? You know, in your life, you spend half your life as a disabled person, as a wheelchair user, I know for sure, backing for reasonable adjustments, be it simply being able to get up the curb to get to the bus stop or get on the bus and get the pram moved out of the way or, you know, to be able to get into the coffee shop in town, you spend your whole life having to get reasonable adjustments for things. And the workplace is, is very, very similar. I'm very lucky that the BBC have been very, very good at making reasonable adjustments, getting all the assistive technology in place. But the unfortunate thing I would say when it comes to getting reasonable adjustments is you have to think of yourself on your worst day which many of us as disabled people, we don't like to do mm -hmm. because we constantly want to think of the best version of ourselves and do as much as we can for ourselves within our limitations. But you have to think of yourself on your worst day and think, what am I going to do if, you know, my, heart, my left hand's too stiff to be able to type? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? What happens if the other week I had a really bad cough and I could hardly talk, you know, without coughing? What are the adjustments that I need in place to be able to do the job the best I can do and how can I do that you know that might be carers that might be assistive technology that might be taxi to and from work whatever it might be but always think in terms of your worst day and apply the same fight apply the same yeah always apply the same fight that you do to having to get a ramp to get into a coffee shop or you know, having to get a space at a gig because, you know, there's loads of people crowded around the space where you should be. Uh, you know, a private, to the, a private zeal to, to the workplace, if you like, and think, you know, I need to be able to do this. Therefore, you know, this is what I need to have in place to be able to do what I want to do. Yeah, I think that's kind of like a really great point because I think sometimes we look at kind of, non-disabled people and we'll be like oh but they don't need that so I should be able to do that without that and actually it's okay to ask for help for you to be able to do your job properly but kind of what would you say to kind of young disabled people that are kind of watching this now and they're like oh my god that's like a really cool idea and I really want to do that where would you kind of tell them to start you know what I was 15, 16, 17, and 2009, 2010. And smartphones didn't really exist yet yeah. back then. The internet, the internet was a thing. I spent hours and hours reading Wikipedia biographies of, you know, famous historical people and learning historical tidbits and everything like that. So there's so many more avenues for people now, be it setting up your own podcast that you can record on your phone or do Zoom interviews with people because so many people will take time out to talk to you, to chat with you via Twitter DM or whatever format you prefer. People will take time out to talk to you. So try that and think about how you can, you know, so how maybe set up your own podcast or set up your own blog or, you know, um, I set up a social media Twitter account and these are all things that you can do to get yourself known and kind of get yourself a platform really but also try out experimenting as many things as you can do so I'll give you an example here I'm sat here now but because I can't hold the phone in a reasonable position and I know that if my leg hit the table it's going to fly it's balanced against my laptop so you yeah, know I do that, that, too. That, that, that's yeah 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 that, that's 
that's from painful experience of right I've, I've got to balance the screen against my laptop because otherwise it's going to fall over because I've learned you know balance it against the pile of books alongside it always falls over so you know you learn as you go on don't be afraid to take a chance on something don't be afraid to do something different you are as a disabled person fortunately you are going to fail more often than not you are going to have bad days you are going to have days when your hands just don't work or you just can't be motivated or you know you've got 10,000 other things going on or you know you can't get your laptop to balance or yeah you your body's too wobbly that you can't go and film that day don't be afraid don't be afraid of those things you know they, they are going to happen work around them and work through them you know work kind of okay you know Wednesday might be a bad day but let's see how Thursday's going to be and try and be as flexible with your, with your own schedule. Try and be, as, you know, if you've got school or you've got work or you've got college or whatever it might be, then understand that. Many people do criticise spoon theory, but I think one of the applications of spoon theory is that you do only have a certain amount of spoons to get to do what you want to go and do. So if you only have a certain amount of spoons and you've got to use those spoons to do the shopping or do the cooking or have a shower or use the toilet, they're all valid things. There might be another day when you've got more spoons and more energy to kind of do the media things that you want to go do. So I would say go to set up a blog or set up a social media account or set up an Instagram account or whatever record voice notes on your phone and record a little I don't know, mini podcast to yourself or or something that's one of the ways I started out before I started the BBC was recording recording podcasts on my laptop and on my phone and that kind of thing or you know um set up set up zoom calls and host I don't know uh live feed zoom calls on YouTube or something like that or even better you know if there's a local gig going on in your area email all the local journalists at your local newspaper and see if they might want somebody to cover that gig and then you might go to the gig and you might get the ticket to the gig and you might get you know your PA's ticket to the gig paid for and you can go and, and do the gig and everything like that but also coming back to that point about PA's people will love to do things with you one of my biggest problems I if I'm being candid is that sometimes I haven't accepted that I need help to do things and I think I can back on and do things myself constantly but I think I can get the train to five different places in one day or that I can go to a football match followed by a gig without anybody there to back me up sometimes you need somebody to back me up it's not got to be a formal PA or care or yeah. somebody like that but you might have a mate who's interested in football or interested in music or interested in food or coffee or whatever it might be invite them along and if you've not got the money to pay them to be a PA or whatever day buy them a cup of coffee you know I'm sure I'm sure they'll, they'll love that experience of being able to tag along with you and go to that gig or go to that concert or whatever it might be and you know a lot of my friends when I was a teenager and they used to go to gigs they'd always come and visit gigs because I'd get my ticket half price because I'd, yeah, I you know, they'd, pay, they'd, they'd pay me the half the money, half the money to get into the gig. And, you know, pe people will love that. That's a good um, <laughs> A learned tip, a learned tip, I tell you that one. Uh, but no, you know, it's like, I mean, I went to a football match a while back with a mate of mine and... The simple thing of having my mate to be able to go and help me out when I needed things or help me on and off the train or help me to negotiate the public transport that day, you know, saved so much time and meant I was able to do so much more than if I was just doing it myself. Yeah, I think it's so important for people to remember that it's like, it's okay if you need somebody else there. Because I think especially with like things like public transport, even if you were going to like work or whatever, Public transport is supposed to be easy to access, but unfortunately it just isn't in this country, particularly if you're a wheelchair user. So I think it's really important to note that actually don't be too hard on yourself if you need somebody else to help you. That but I is, don't like that is, go, you go. Sorry, no, that no, you public go. transport point is actually really important because back when I was living in London and I'd have days off, 
you know, I would try to trek halfway across town to meet friends or whatever it might be. And guess what? Only around 20% of the tube yeah. is actually independently accessible if you're a wheelchair user. So welcome to being dependent on the kindness of strangers. And oh, if you're trying to get to Finsbury Park to try at your mate's hipster cafe, good up with that without getting a 30 pound taxi or, yeah. or, or whatever. And they, they, they are genuine real buckles. So you end up thinking, oh, it's, it's, it's not accessible, so I can't do this. And, you know, oh, it's too much effort on my day off, so you end up not going. And you end up being isolated from things. I mean, there's this one time I went to a comedy gig in London. Great comedy gig, great podcast. Brian Bolt, Brian Bolt Boat Club, he's a great Irish, Irish comedian and just general creative. And going to the gig, it cost me £30 to get there. 20 quid for the ticket to get in mm. and 40 pounds to get back. Yeah. Maybe it's 30, 30, I'll do it again. It cost me 35 pounds to get there, 20 quid for the gig and 42 pounds to get back. So all in all, whereas an undisabled person would have been able to hop on the tube and pay a five or whatever, I find myself paying 70 odd pound extra for, for, for a night out that you know, an undisabled person not got that barrier. So sometimes it is more difficult and it is more problematic to go and do things and be social, but also don't be afraid of that. We live in the great era of Zoom. We live in the great era of all this technology. So don't be afraid about using the technology to catch up with friends. Have a Zoom call with them or, you know, have, 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 I mean, some best tracks I ever made. So, like, two hour long phone calls yeah. where we're both sat in our bedrooms just having a gas or, you know, walking around the park or whatever, you know. Don't be afraid of, you know, doing those, doing those things and having those little reasonable adjustments because, and they are reasonable adjustments in terms of your social life because mm-hmm. sometimes you're not going to be able to get to that uber cool cafe or that uber no. cool yeah. gig, gig venue. And don't be hard on yourself for that. It's society that's the problem, not you. I mean, yeah, I know really that's a really good point. And I think people, I mean, I don't mind the term disabled, but I think we need to look at it as a fact that society is disabled to us at the same time. And that's why we can't get around. But I mean, like there, you kind of mentioned about reasonable adjustments, but I know you mentioned as well that you went for a scheme. Are the schemes something that you would recommend to other disabled people to do? I would say if you've got to find a way in, you know, it's it's an invaluable way in. If places are recruiting people on schemes as a way to get them in, then go for it and use that as a mechanism to get your voice heard, for sure. Because otherwise, if you don't go for the scheme and you don't apply for that scheme as a disabled journalist or black journalist or whatever it might be, then they're going to think, oh, you know, there aren't the disabled journalists or the black journalists who are interested in these schemes. So, you know, we're not going to bother winning it or whatever. So always put yourself forward with these things and always, always try for sure. Do you think then that kind of journalism and radio, do you think they're welcoming to disabled people or do you think there could be more that's done to help that? I think um, in an industry that's always office-based, traditionally office-based, an industry that can be quite energetic and quite frantic and everything like that, I think there are always challenges in terms of making things accessible. But I will say the BBC were excellent for me in terms of helping me, you know, get all the adjustments that I needed in place and, you know, be it the taxi into the office or the uh, because public transport was so inaccessible or you know a laptop or uh dragon dictates so i'm able to dictate my notes rather than type all those things always little reason for adjustments are actually really very really invaluable and sometimes if you go in on a scheme and you go in on those things then that, that can be a surefire way to get the reasonable adjustments that you need to get um and, you know, your colleagues are going to be, yeah, some colleagues might be awkward about, you know, why is he shouting into it? Why is he shouting his article into a laptop? I know I had that for sure when I first started at BBC. But actually, you know, that's just my way of doing it. That's just my way of doing it. It might take me five minutes longer to write out a brief or whatever, but that's maybe five minutes more thinking time I've got kind of on writing the brief. It might take me about a little bit longer to 
edit a tape, but you know, it's still going to get done at the end of the day. And just, just you know, you know, people, people have got, people have got, I've got to realise that, and I've got to realise that kind of, you know, how do I say this? But you know, my, people are going to realise that sometimes the challenges are there, that people are going to struggle, but actually. You know that things can be made accessible and things should be made accessible in a good corporate practice like exists at the BBC, like exists at ITV, like exists at Channel 4, like exists at Sky, you are like exists at Capital, whatever it's called now, or Reach, you are going to get the proper kind of infrastructure in place to allow you to be able to do the best job you can do. Yeah, and I mean, for me, primarily as a journalist, I use like kind of, I talk to my computer for it to type to me because I only have the one hand. I mean, I found that invaluable for getting work done a lot quicker and a lot more efficiently. But is there any kind of advice that you'd give to maybe like hiring managers that are aware that they should really be looking at hiring more disabled people and utilising their skills, but don't really know where to start in terms of reasonable adjustments and things like that? I don't think it's about journalism. I think it's about society as a whole and it's about the way society sees disabled people. And, you know, of course society is going to have black holes about disability because, let's face it, most non-disabled people don't know a disabled person or don't know a disabled person that they consider to be disabled. Many people know disabled people in their lives, maybe Parkinson's, maybe a stroke or whatever, but they never stop and take account of the barriers that these people face. So actually, if people think about, I don't know, their grandmother, I mean, I've got three grandparents, two have got dementia, one's lost his sight, and they are all disabled. But because they're old and, you know, one thing or another, we don't think about how we can address society to them. So think about, the, if you're a hiring manager, you're somebody like that, think about the people that you know in your community or whatever, and think about how you maybe, who are disabled, who might have impairments or whatever. Think about how you can make those, think about how you can make your job adapted to them. And sure, there will be a way to, to adapt that job to that person. You know, I mean, I grew up in Spain. In Spain, you know, the local bin men, I'll uh, do that again. I spent a bit of time growing up in Spain, in the south of Spain, and in the village where I was, there was this, one of the bin men had Down syndrome because somebody had thought outside the box and thought about how we can make this job for Pedro, or whatever his name was, how we can adapt this job to that particular person. So people can do that, and there are so many jobs that disabled people can do. Hey, we should have disabled baristas, disabled disabled delivery drivers, disabled bus drivers, disabled whatever it might be. You know, we can have these jobs so that they are done by disabled people. It just requires a little bit of thinking outside the box. Absolutely. And I mean, is there anything you, that you kind of wish you knew about your industry before going into it as a disabled person? Uh, sometimes you've got to stop trying to please everybody. You know, you can't you know, work 365 days a year and have a social life and be in Manchester to watch Man City and do everything. So sometimes some things have got to go by the wayside. And sometimes the biggest problem when you're starting out in an industry, <laughs> my dad calls it the, there's breaking news and editors in the office situation, which is kind of, you've got particular news, you've got to remember that you can't be in the office all the time. It's inhumanely impossible to be in the office all the time. And sometimes you have to just accept that, you know, you're not going to be the one that gets to break that story or put on that story all the time. And that is difficult. But one thing I wish I'd know is to take more rest time, actually. And you have to be responsible for that. Not necessarily your company, but you yourself have to be responsible for taking as many breaks or taking a day off here or a day off there so you can make it work for you mm -hmm. yeah no absolutely and I think I mean I'm conscious of your time so I'm going to wrap it up here but I think a nice way to end it is what what's the one piece of advice you'd give to anyone that wanted to do your job 
if you can't see it, you can't be it, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go deep into the Faith Martin archives here, and I'm going to draw up that video you did uh, for Coronation Street on Gary and Izzy and yeah. their relationship and Cory, and you being a teenager or however old you were, and seeing that on Terry. If you can't see a disabled person on Terry or in the media, or if you can't hear them on the radio, right, then, chan then you know, you're not going to think it's a career that's open to you. So try and put that in your own life. Try and think about, you know, put yourself up for everything as much as possible, but also remember that you are only human and that, you know, sometimes you do have to take the reasonable adjustments wherever you need them, but try and just just push as hard as you can and keep up the good, keep up the good work. And it's nice. You are do, you are you are doing good work, right? You, even though you, even though you random view of this video might not think you're doing enough, even though you might think you know the grass is always greener on the other side, you are doing good work. So keep it up. Alex, no absolute pleasure. Um, thank you so much. I think it's going to be so helpful to so many people. Um, so to everyone that watches it, I hope you really enjoy it and you found this useful and I'll see you next time on Voice Mag.